Thank you, everyone. Um, the first thing I want to check is whether my colleague Bas is in the crowd, because I don't see him there. Okay, well, that's not way to play. Um, super happy to hear it, be here. Um, I wonder how everybody is uh, it's feeling after yesterday. So, so. <laughs> Wie geht es dir? Wir haben eine Karte. Kein Kartas? Das kann ich. So, that, that's my German. We uh, get it in high school. And but, uh, I'll keep it simple for today and uh, I'll just keep it to English. I think that, that looks much better for everyone. Um, yeah, we had a party yesterday and we had another party in, uh, in June. And this, this always feels like Christmas to me. And I love to see you look forward to it. You have those announcements that you hope that will come. You have those disappointments. That's what I love to see. Um, but if I look back, these are the highlights for me from the past few years. So you had Codable and Swift 4. Codable was, you know, like you could definitely remove at least one dependency from your project, which was a nice. Um, Boolean on top of There's There's a Dutch flag. Um, it was a Dutch developer that um, announced it, you know, that did the proposal. It was Chris. So, some kind of special. You have the opaque return types. I'm going to talk a bit more about that today. You have SPM resources. Of course, last year you had async away. You know, like we've been looking forward to that for years. That was, that was amazing. Yeah, and then we had this year. And I was like, what do I hope for? And it was, it was, there was not really a particular thing that I really looked forward for. And, you know, I had the recent Swift, Swift data and like replacement of core data. Um, I still have the tweets. It wasn't there. Um, but if we look at the related proposals, there were quite a lot of Swift changes in this year's WDC. You had um, distributed actors, you had the regex, that was announced quite big actually compared to how many people use it, I think. Um, but there were a lot of other small improvements that came kind of back in the Swift dedicated sessions. So we had the embrace Swift generics, and the design protocol interfaces in Swift. Those were the two talks that we went deep. And to me, the first time I saw the title, Design Protocol Interfaces in Swift, it felt a bit like going back a few years. I know this is something we already have for a few years. So I decided to look into the proposals related to the sessions. And these proposals are both from Swift 5.7 as well as from Swift 5.5, you know, a few older ones. But if we highlight some of the keywords there, there's opening types existentials, associated types, I started to see a pattern. And I had a great idea to do a talk two weeks after the WTC, so you know, I had to <laughs> come up with a topic. So I decided to dive into what it says. And when I did, I found this, uh, this pull request, Swift is open source, and um, this was also part of the release in Swift 5 and 7. The, the changes were in the way, but look at the list. Ravers and GR issues, um, quite some things were fixed related to generics. So it's generics, protocols, opaque types, existentials, all kinds of improvements that we saw this year. I'm not sure when, when you started developing, but back in the early days of Swift, no incremental builds, we, we experienced no incremental builds. We did. That was a pain, wasn't it? You know, waiting five minutes for your build to finish. Um, but they, they set up all for generics for Swift 3, and it was called the Generics Manifesto. And um, it, it basically contained like extensions for protocols, um, all, all kinds of things that we are so familiar with today when working with generics and protocols and such. And one thing that, that caught my eyes was, was this title removing the necessary restrictions. Basically, they want to make it as easy as possible for us to work with generics and Swift. So this is a quote from Ben Cohen. Um, Swift by Sandel podcast. I highly recommend listening to it in general, but maybe in particular this episode with Ben. Make generics work naturally, the way people expect it to work. It's almost like you wouldn't even notice that you're using generics. 
So let's go back. Who knows, who knows this guy? Who, who recognizes this guy? <laughs> this, yeah, Chris, yeah, this, this was quite, um, quite a hype, I would say, 2015. Everybody started doing protocol oriented programming because this session was, was quite amazing. Yeah? If we look into one of the changes that was announced in that year for Swift 2, we have a protocol content and it comes with a function, make favorite. And in Swift 1 to 2, if you have that make favorite method and you inherit from the protocol, each item had to implement that make favorite method itself. Right? So you can see that we have three definitions of the make favorite method. So in Swift 2, we started removing unnecessary restrictions. So what you could now do is extend the protocol and implement the method. And you might not realize that we're actually working with generics, right? We have a generic protocol content and we extend it with the make favorite method. So it's almost as if you didn't notice. So Swift's goal is to make your life as a developer easier. This is literally quoted from, uh, from this year's WC session. But I'm not sure about you. There's no many types, existential types, time pressure, associated types, you know, the whole kind of thing. You know, we have <laughs> beer from yesterday. And I'm here to tell you about generics and open types and all those kinds of things. So I hope that this topic at the end of the conference will still make sense. I try to keep it as simple as I can. Um, but also see it as a start, you know. Um, I think it's important for you to know that generics is not something you have to use in your apps. You know, it's more a tool to get to a solution, but there's many different ways of doing it as well. So try to see what you can get from my talk, and there's articles I wrote myself about these topics as well, so you can just take it easy after the conference. But that's the that idea. And start with generics. So this is a simple example of an, uh, an insect. We can, uh, we can push a few items, and we can pop an item from the end. With a lag array of items. And you know, that's a way of making that generic is by introducing an element that basically allows you to, you know, add any type in that container. You actually use this quite a lot already. Because this is simply a stack or an array of items with a type string. And generics allows you to use that same underlying logic. But then we have different types, for example, in There's type constraints as well. So here, as you can see, we compare the value to the value that we want to find. And this is possible because we say like, the generic type T needs to be constrained to the equitable protocol. And that allows the compiler to accept this code and allows you to compare the object that you want to find. You can do the same in extensions of arrays, like here. Any outcome will be the same. And if we start using this code, we use the global method, the extension method on the error. And actually, this is um, part of the Swift API default, which is using the API. <laughs> <laughs> This was already the best on the short So they didn't tell you. But every time I say the word generics. <laughs> Due to the generics. 
And once again, you, know, you, you could write that find index method two times, you know, for an integer and for a string individually. Works perfectly fine out to you, and you don't have to do complicated generics. But this saves you some duplication, and you only have to test the code once. So, how about opaque tests? If you're using SwiftUI, you're already using that. You might have seen that keyword, the sum view. And the sum keyword basically tells the compiler this will be some struct or some class. And due to it, the compiler kind of predicts the outcome of the element and can perform optimization for your code. And your code will be naturally better and more performant. But I'm not sure about you, but the sum view in the body of the Swift UI view has been like for a long time the only place that I used it. You can use it in more places and we'll show that in this talk. So in this case, we can see that we have a big footer view. And if you're pro, you will see the text like, hey, they're pro, and otherwise we kind of want to upsell based on the beautiful views that was showed earlier. This is the, the first prototype. Um, but you will uh, run into this error because there's no open kind of this one. And with that, I mean that for the compiler, it's, it's it's hard to predict the outcome element. Could it be a text element? Or it could be a v-stack, tube of view, and a text of a button of that. Right? Um, so this doesn't work. And one thing to solve this, right? Easy. We just turn v-stack around all the elements, but the downside here is that when the user is pro, we still have the outer container v-stack that we don't need, so it's an extra element that needs to be drawn, so that's not what you want. So the option actually is, um, and this is by default inherited in the Swift UI view body map method, um, is to add the attributes for the view builder. View builders are still builders. If you want to know more about that, you can create your own as well. Um, I encourage you to read my article about it. Um, but this, this is one way you can use object types yourselves. But how do they relate to generics? <laughs> we need more beer, I don't think like this, but... <laughs> would be unfair, right? All right, um, yeah, so this is uh, the transcript. You've seen a few pictures of it before in process talk. And we allow you to send files from A to B. And those files are all kinds of content files, it right? could be movies, PDFs, PNGs. And I want to take you on a journey where you want to create like a way to favorite types of content. So let's dive in. We once again have a script with an image content. And we create a favorite image content store. And the favorite image content store comes with a method to append any content to your, in this case, memory cache, based on the identifier that we have. And we also define a method to read out whether the content item is favorite. So we can either you know, show a already built um, art in the design. We can use the code by just favoriting an array of content items. In this case, it's just a single image content. But as I shared, we have multiple types of content. So what if we introduce it? Video content. It no longer works because we have a favorite image content store that only knows how to work with image content. So let's see if we can, uh, we can improve this code. We have an image content and a video content, and as you can see, they look quite similar. So we can introduce a content protocol, which comes with the ID and the URL. And then we go back to the earlier methods. And we try to change this code to the protocol. But voila, it works. This works in Swift 5.6. It's all good, all works fine. But what are the differences? Because we have so many dedicated talks about object types and existential. So what, what did actually change? So you might have seen a possible improvement that we can make here because we have the ID. Um, there's a protocol called identifiable in Swift. So we can basically inherit it this way. We don't need that property anymore because it's already defined in the identifiable protocol. And we constrain it to be 
the type of the EU and the EW define the river. This way, 5 and 6. You might have seen this error come up. And this was often a method where I went into and I was like, yeah, but why doesn't this work? You know, like it's almost the same, I'm just constrained and you should be able to do what to do. And they were literally the in the of the disease as an issue because now it just works. Which I'm super happy with. So before we show that that code where it just works, I want to show you like how you can do this in square five and six, right? So here we have the is favorite method and we create a constraint of type T that conforms to the protocol content. The compiler is happy. We can do the same with the where class. But if we go back and we just use the content element, you can see that we still have that error. And one way of solving it now is with 5 and 7 would be to use the object type sum. So we basically say like we want to have some type that conforms to the protocol content. And if we compare this, you basically do the same. And in a way it's a pity that we are more experienced with developers, or at least maybe you're just getting started. If so, I, I believe it's easier to get your head around the sum, right? Because you don't have to forget about the previous way of writing, but you can basically say that, that some protocol sentence is short and for T, where T conforms to protocol. And all we know is there's, there's going to be some failure conforming to that protocol, right? So that, that's basically how you should read it. So just like with generics, the, the underlying type is fixed for the scope of the value. And I'll, I'll explain it later with some examples. If the generic is only used in one place, so only in one method definition and not in a return type, for example, um, you can use it now with some keyword, it's a shorthand. And I believe that code becomes easier to read. You don't have that, well, more difficult generic kind of syntax to learn. Generics. Okay, nice. This is a good way for me to bring as well. It's uh, much easier than normally. Um, yeah, so but how about existentials? So we have existential any, and I want to go back to the previous implementation of the favorite given to the content store. And this time I want to zoom in to the, uh, the favorite method where we pass in several types of content. If we update the user new content with the constraint to be identified or protocol, we will see the same error again. Just like before, we can solve it using generics. And if we use it, it just works fine. But there's one trick here, it's, it's all consistent. You know, the type of, of content is consistent. It's all games content. So if we suddenly introduce a video content there, it starts to break, and this doesn't work. And that's all because we have the constraint where T conforms to collection and T that element conforms to the same type of content. So you might think like, oh, let's use object type. But once again, with object types, the type is fixed for the scope of the value. So it should be the same. It can't be any type. And that's why you have the energy work. So you, you lose the type relationship. The compiler now only knows that it's a content protocol, but it no longer knows whether it's in image content, video content, and so on. So it's good to understand that this has an impact of performance, right? The compiler can do less optimizations that it would otherwise do with, you know, like unknown type, as you can tell. So this, this, this might still not be like this. So I want to show you a few examples of how you can look at existentials in a different way with different code examples. And, and to me, it, it sounds like a content box, right? So we have a content box, it conforms to content, and inside there's any type of content. But we still use existentials here, so let's take another example. And this one might be more familiar. You might even have written this yourself in certain circumstances. And what we basically do here is we, it's type ratio, right? We create an outer any content that conforms to the protocol, and it's inherited from an inner content type. 
But in the end, we only know that it's any content, and we have no idea what kind of content is inside because we lost that type of relationship. Hopefully, that makes a bit more. So we have any value, and we know it's at least that it conforms to content. And I want to dive in a bit more on the focus, right? So here we have a beautiful property any content. I, I hope it's readable, by the way, in the back, but um, you, it's just an any content variable that you can change to any content. So in this case, we start with an image content, and we can change it to a video content, and it all works fine. If we were to use open text, we run into the same problem. Because in the scope of the value, the type cannot change. So we can only change it to an image content and not to a video content. So in summary, any protocol stands for any value conforming to a certain protocol. Swift 5 to 7 has support for self and associated types, as we saw with the identifiable protocol inheritance. It's good to know that it will be enforced from Swift 6. Um, the thing is, with, with the any keyword, Swift kind of forces you to be aware of the performance impact. So yeah, I'll, I'll get back to this later, but in Xcode 40, you will be um, getting more of these kind of like enforcements, more and more, and um, it's not always the right suggestion to give because sometimes you can use opaque types instead. I'll get to that later. Um, so yeah, existences are unpredictable for a compiler. The type and ratio doesn't make it possible for them to do the optimizations they would otherwise be able to do. So you might recognize this slide from um, the WCC session. I just decided to add a code example to it as well. So what you basically see is that if you want to create an array with some, the content type needs to be consistent. And with existentials, you can put any type of content in it, right? And with some, we guarantee to have the type of relationships. The pilot still knows same as content. With existentials, the pilot only knows its protocol. So that was a quick dive. Are we still okay? Yeah. Um, I want to go to over, over a few practical examples. I really hope that with the notes that I just shared, it, it kind of clicks for them. So, um, yeah, let, let's see and let's dive in. So, here we have a print element method. And as you can see, we have a T for T constraint, custom string convertible. And we learned that obey type stands a shorthand for T where T conforms to program. So, we can rewrite this and use the sum keyword. In this uh, example, I want to let you imagine this being part of a module, like an open source package that is used by many other developers, for example. And in this case, we have a remote image fetcher. And as you can see, we um, define the method as public. And the return type is the remote image fetcher type. And since it's a public method, we need to expose that type as well. And as an SDK developer, you cannot want to expose as less as possible because that allows you to breaking changes easier without, you know, breaking the public API without having your implementers to, you know, do the changes themselves as well. So let's see how we can do that. So we introduced uh, a protocol in stretching, and due to the protocol, we can now inherit the remote image structure for it. And as you can see, the remote image structure itself is no longer public. Only the protocol is public. So as long as we keep the protocol itself consistent, we can change anything to the remote image structure, like renaming the remote image structure, for example, and that doesn't require any changes from the implement security gate. But one downside is that the image structure is really strict to UI image, and as an SDK developer, you might want to support macOS as well. You want to return an NS image, for example. So we introduce an associated type image. And as you can see, Xcode tries to help us here. And it suggests to use any. That would be a good suggestion. So let's use it and see how it works. And the pilot is happy. But using any totally depends on the inner body of the method. So in this case, we check whether the URLs are file URL. And if so, we use the local image structure. But if it's a remote one, you return 
a different type, a remote image engine. For the compiler, this means that the type is not consistent for the scope of the delay, right? So it could either be a local image engine or a remote image engine. So using any is actually something you need to do here. And we basically only return an image matching protocol. But if we only use a remote image fetcher, the type will always be consistent in the scope of the method, right? We always return a remote image fetcher. So in this case, we can opt out from what Xcode suggested, because Xcode would still suggest any, even if your body is like this. Change it to some, benefit from performance, and it all works the same. So let's go back to this example. We now create an extension of UI image and we want to allow implementers of the SDK to more easily use the image fetcher when they work with the UI image view. And in this case, we want to allow them to configure an image with a certain image fetcher. But as you can see, the compiler doesn't know how to deal with this. You know, the associated type kind of messes up because there's no relationship anymore. So the, the, the type of the image is even uncertain. So what we can do, we can define a primary associate type here, which is in this case the image, once again. And what we now can do is we can update the constraint of the existential, these are known as constraints, existential types, to be a UI image. And in this case, it all works. Um, the proposal is it's underneath. And actually, we can opt in to perform the benefits here as well because it's still the same image measure with the scope of the, of the method. I was thinking what kind of questions would I possibly get. Um, this might be one of them. So do we, do we still need any view? Um, it's actually interesting. So in there was a slide as well during the WC. And um, most of the popular questions are captured. You can find them still on the internet. And this was one of them actually. There's Apple developers replying on it and giving clear answers. Definitely check it out if you want to just casually learn some things that you might not expect. I learned quite a few things. And um, in this case, like in general, I never really used any view either way. But if you're still considering, like, should I still use it? I believe like a few builder and, and generics should, should probably solve most of the cases. The beers are empty, isn't it? We're almost there, so that's good. Um, yeah, and I think a big difference is that an existential can be initiated where any few can be initiated. But yeah, I, I, I believe you should be able to stay away from any few today. And if, if, if I pronounce this, it doesn't make any sense, but if the lowercase any relates to the lowercase first any or any object, um, I wrote about this. There is some relation, but um, there are definitely different types. Um, so if you want to know more about this, I encourage you to read my article about it. So to wrap up, I want to give you some guidance. I would start with some, if generic some use in one place. And if you're unsure what that means, just try it out and you'll notice like, hey, this doesn't work because I'm using generics in multiple places. So try to start with some. Change some to any when you need to store an arbitrary value, like random values, just like I showed in the examples before. And use generics if you have multiple type constraints, right? So if you use multiple generics inside a certain method. We still feel an awful lot. It's okay. And to be honest, um, I did a few talks before this one and I really had a hard time making, making, preparing this one, right? Like, you have to understand it and then you also need a way to explain it as well. It's, it's a really difficult topic and I'm still struggling with it myself sometimes. So, once again, don't feel like you should know everything about it now to see it as an entrance point and read up on it more and try to play around with it. And with that, I want to tell you that all these topics from my talk are written down as well. Uh, that's my basic way of preparing a talk, so um, there's much more details in it. This is just the sum keywords. There's generics as well, and there's um, existentials as well. So go check it out. 
There's a few other projects that I offer um, Swiftly jobs if you're looking for a job or if you want to promote your job at the company. Um, Swiftly we'd be um, creating articles every week that I think are worth reading. Um, it might help you better to you know, narrow down the articles that you want to read. And then lastly, I'm not sure if you know this application. Um, it's a hobby project that I have. Um, there's a little giveaway. Hopefully the QR code works. Um, it also gives you links to the articles that I mentioned before, so it would be a great way to continue the journey into a big test. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll leave it on so you can get it from the screen afterwards. No um, I also have a page. I saw somebody uh, in an earlier talk giving stickers away, and everybody was happy with stickers. I was like, I thought it was pins. No, <laughs> Either way, I brought up pins, so if you like pins, go, uh, go find me and I'll, I'll give you a few. And that was it. Thanks a lot for joining me and this late.
feel free to also approach me after, you know, I can do discussing. Thank you very much.